Um, good afternoon and good morning, depending on where you're at in the uh, in the country. Or actually, good afternoon because we probably have some folks um, from overseas as well. So, uh, welcome everybody. We're going to talk about dyslexia today. We're going to go over um, some key points about dyslexia and a case study. Um, again, my name is Adam Scheller, and I'm a senior co consultant with um, with Pearson. My background is in psychology. I'm a psychologist and uh, practice in both public and non-public schools in uh, the U.S and now I consult with, uh, with Pearson. So welcome everybody. Um, I just got back from the National Association of School Psychology meeting in, uh, in San Antonio, so not sure if any of you are coming from there, but uh, it was great, great weather and a great meeting. So this is what we're gonna talk about today. We are gonna hit dyslexia and we're gonna quickly go over um, symptoms, causes and correlates and risk factors. And we'll do that through a, uh, a pretty neat model of hybrid uh, assessment for dyslexia. We're going to talk about screening, diagnostic identification, intervention possibilities is going to be more of a, a group discussion and thoughts on progress monitoring. So um, really we're going to hit this through um, we're going to hit this through a case study. So we're going to hit the case study a little bit, you know, maybe in about 10, 15 minutes, and we're going to be able to go through it. Um, so it should be um, it should be a pretty fun, pretty fun hour for us. And we have a lot of different professionals on the line with us. We have a huge number of folks. So if you are experiencing, um, I know we get a lot of questions about lag or, or audio. Um, it is definitely, you have to take a consideration about um, slowness of internet speeds on your end or even through the server's end. But we do have a whole, a huge number of folks, school psychologists, speech pathologists, edu educators. Um, and I'm really excited to have everybody here with us. I will let you know first before we get started that I am going to talk about um, 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 this case study and we will be uh, going over some assessments published by Pearson. So just to let you know that you know, you know, I am working for Pearson, so I'm going to talk about some assessments that I've done in this case study that were Pearson specific. So um, you will hear that. It's not, uh, it's not uncommon for us to, to talk about those. Very quickly, for those of us who are speech pathologists or those of you who are speech pathologists, um, there was an error in the, um, the ASHA CE um, um, announcement, so there are going to be no ASHA CEs for this. It's an hour, but if you do need a certificate, we are able to give you a certificate of attendance, and, and that is usually um, good for, for tracking your, your professional development, so just let us know about that as well. So before we get started, I want to just go over this and, and kind of bring us all together again. I really like to, to, to bring us together and have us thinking in the same in the same space, and um, this is a really neat quote. It's a, I'll read it. Uh, I think it's a sign of prob probably how well I tried to hide it when I was a little kid. I remember at the time being concerned that other people would find out about it. Now, interestingly enough, um, you know, that's a quote from a pretty famous person who is dyslexic, that's Anderson Cooper. Um, for those of you who do not know who Anderson Cooper is, he's a pretty famous um, news anchor on CNN, um, and he is an admitted dyslexic. Let's look at another one. Never feeling ashamed of myself, I will take two hours and 45 minutes to three hours to read 120 pages. It takes me about two hours and 45 minutes to read what most people can read in about an hour and 10 minutes. I just know that I'm still slow at reading, but I've learned to adjust. And uh, anybody have any guesses? Uh, that's, that's Steven Spielberg, a uh, renowned director. And interestingly enough, when we have those, you know, I want to start out with those two quotes from these two famous folks because, you know, we're talking about dyslexia. We're talking about a condition that is, um, it is it's fairly common, and we want to make sure that um, we have a viewpoint of success rather than a failure. And it's interesting when we think and start going back and thinking about the, uh, um, disorders or learning issues. Um, you know, that, that folks can persist through these types of problems. And we, as professionals in the field, can really, um, can really think about how we can impact them and get, get, get youngsters through that and become successful, um, adaptive adults. Very quickly, just to bring us all together in terms of the definitions of dyslexia, um, you know, I, I like this. This is a combination that I put together, which is, from the International Dyslexia Association um, definition of 2002, but also the more recent 2015 um, Senate resolution from Senators Cassidy and Mikulski. Um, and really what the important thing to think about is the first point is that 
dyslexia is definitely neurobiological in origin. We understand that, and we have a very good understanding of their neurological correlates of dyslexia, and it's important for us to know that. It, the second point is that it's unexpected, and most of the time unexpected, in that most folks who have dyslexia have an intelligence or have an ability, cognitive ability level, that's higher than, um, than what we would um, expect in someone with a significant learning disability. Dyslexia is definitely language-based, and I'll get to that a little bit more in a second. Uh, it's characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. Now, these are going to be symptoms and, and um, observational behaviors that we can see. And it typically results from deficits in the phonological components of language. And secondary consequences, they also do include problems with reading comprehension. Of course, if we have definite difficulties with basic reading, that reading comprehension will, will suffer. Um, and, uh, you know, it can impede the growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. And it's important to just kind of bring these points out is that it is unexpected. And it is often present with an uneven cognitive profile. And I want you to really start thinking about that uneven cognitive profile when we go over our case in a little bit, because does it make sense to have somebody with, um, with, with consistently low scores across the board, or what do we expect to see in, in a youngster um, with dyslexia? And I, I, you know, I brought that out before, but it is, it is more common than we, than we um, maybe initially could think, but approximately 20% of the population shows symptoms of dyslexia and difficulties with reading. And again, that it is language-based. And really what I mean by language-based is, is this, you know, I came up with this little thing. I don't know if you've seen something like this before or not, but I really like the idea of this, this, um, this, this scale or this uh, seesaw, you know, as I have two young kids, a four and a, an eight-year-old, and, and I love to find the seesaw in the, in, the, uh, in the parks. But the seesaw really, if we look at it this way, is, um, and we start in terms of the ideas of development of language, language starts first um, in an oral receptive component. So we first um, start to develop language by ear uh, or receptive oral language, and then we start to develop um, expressive oral languages and vocabulary and speaking. And um, written, written receptive language and written expressive language come second to that. And when we think about language, language is both oral and written. So understanding dyslexia in the context of a language disorder, a language-based disorder, is super, super important. And I know that can be confusing sometimes because oftentimes when we think about dyslexics um, or, uh, or kids with dyslexia or even if you looked at Anderson Cooper, I mean, he's got amazing um, oral language skills. Um, he, he, his language is, is a super strength of his. I mean, if you've ever heard him talk and do interviews, he's, he's very good at it. Um, so that's not what we're talking about when we think about lang oral language. We're really thinking about the, the written component of language. And yes, oftentimes that written component can be affected by earlier oral language de deficits. So let's start to think about this model for assessment and what that means based on the definition. And it's important for us to really think about a hybrid model. And why is that? Well, you know, it's never a good idea to just drive diagnosis or drive our understanding of specifically learning disabilities just on one single criterion. It's important for us to think about um, disabilities or deficits in learning from the ideas of, of various viewpoints or from various viewpoints and from various sources of data. Um, you know, the first point is so important that a single criterion uh, is prone to measurement error and really does show that poor stability over time. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. And we really do suggest that at minimum we have more than one measure for the same construct. And I say rinse and repeat, and what I mean by that is you know, find something and then find it again, because we need to make sure that that measurement is not in error. And when we think about that hybrid model of dyslexia, we are looking at multiple sources for information, uh, really looking at, you know, coming from observation, coming from um, um, actual performance, coming from standardized assessment and so forth. And also, so, so important is that second point, which is, the degree to which a student or a young child responds to effective instruction and or intervention. So how is that child responding to what would typically be effective for other children? Are they having difficulty responding to that? And that often is times is the case. Um, I really like this, this slide. Um, it comes from the, uh, a white paper that was written 
um, by a research director at Pearson, um, Christina Bro, who I, there there is a, um, a citation for her in this uh, in this handout in the handout that you have. But the dyslexia model um, comes in if you think about it as terms in terms of hybrid. Um, we think about it in terms of the symptoms and in in uh, in in the presence of a lack of response to treatment. And that lack of response to treatment in this case really means the lack of response to effective instruction. But it's important for us to separate out the symptoms based on reader and pre-reader difficulties because we can already start to see dyslexic symptoms in pre-readers and that looks like alphabet writing difficulties and phonics and letter knowledge or low phonics and letter knowledge. Once they get to the reader level, we start seeing word and, uh, reading and decoding difficulties. Of course, fluency is going to be an issue, of course, we are going to expect that. Um, spe spelling, the orthography component, written expression, and we do expect to see reading comprehension lower than listening comprehension. In terms of causes and correlates, you know, we really start to think about the cognitive processing components of it here and what are the cognitively related um, symptoms and, and, and um, causes that we would expect to see in terms of our assessment. And when we look at our case study, we should expect to see a combination or, uh, or a consistent pattern here. Um, we, we don't have to see all of these, but it, is, it oftentimes is a combination. Phonological processing difficulties, um, slow rapid automatic naming, um, auditory working memory or just general working memory deficits, um, again, slower processing speed, um, long-term storage and retrieval difficulties, so the ability to not only store but effectively retrieve um, what you're learning, associative memory, and then orthographic processing being a difficulty. And all of these occur in light of specific risk factors that increase the risk or the likelihood of, of someone um, um, is, uh, developing or experiencing dyslexia. And of course, family history. We know that since it's neuro neurobiological in origin, that family history plays a huge part in, in dyslexia. Also, language impairment and poor receptive vocabulary. Now, that may seem contradictory to what we talked about in terms of possible strengths, but it is super, super important that you think about um, that, that, that seesaw that I showed you a couple slides ago and think about an oral language difficulty or deficit then leading to written language deficits later on, and that oftentimes can happen. It's important that you, um, that you do that uh, and you think about those as being um, possible risk factors. So let's break that down a little bit more. Um, you know, it is important to think about poor response to instruction being an important symptom, but it's not enough, of course. We know that. We have to make sure we're looking at other things. And again, we break it down by both pre- and post-reading um, symptoms, okay? So that's important for us to really recognize those difficulties. And in this context, for everybody on the call, and again, we have a huge number of people, and thank you so much for coming. But for everybody on this call, I want you to start thinking about it because we are going to be looking at a first grader, all right? So think about the difficulties or the differences between what we're looking at at pre-reader and post and reader, um, you know, post-reader children. So first grader, you know, we can expect to start to see them reading, but we don't necessarily expect reading. So what do we, what should we start to think about in that in that regard? So I want you to start to really, really brainstorm about that. Again, the cognitive process and correlates that I talked about earlier, these are not easily observed. So we have to be, at this point, when we're thinking about the diagnostic components of it, right, if we start to think about the assessment process, we, you know, we start with screening and then we move into the diagnostic testing, these are not easily observed. So we are going to need, most of the time, some type of cognitive assessment for this. So again, it's really important that we process that. Uh, um, effectively. Um, and we start to think about the symptoms before that we talked about they're either attributed to or related to one of these several processes. And IDA of 2016 talked about phonological processing, rapid automatic naming, and auditory working memory being key for a dyslexia evaluation. So it's super important that you think about at least those components in every diagnostic assessment. And again, we look at the risk factors and, you know, hereditary, or hereditary and correlated risk factors and behavioral sim symptoms. So if we combine the two of those, if we start to think about those risk factors and we then start to think about the behavioral presentation or symptomology that a student might have, that really is what we look at as being a robust assessment. 
So we want to make sure that in this situation we combine as much of those components as possible for us to make our assessment robust. Um, again, risk factors could also include things like low scores on a dyslexia screening test, you know, because most dyslexia screening tests, or at least the ones that I'll show you today, um, have a very good ability, a very strong um, effect size to be able to distinguish between students and, uh, with and without disabilities. So that's really important. And again, that increased risk for dyslexia comes from a family history, um, a, a history of language impairment in the student, and or a weakness in re receptive vocabulary. So it is important that we think about this in context of other possible strengths. And um, you know, I talked about earlier that we oftentimes see an uneven profile in these students that uh, we have to start thinking about where we're going to look for uh, contradictory information. So of course we look for consistency between deficits, but we also look for some contradictory information that could prove or could really let, you know, drive us in the direction of, of, of dyslexia. A lot of our students that we see will have fluid reasoning and possible um, problem solving strengths. Again, finding some strengths in those areas. Oral language, listening, speaking, vocabulary, and grammar could be a possible strength, as we saw with some of our, uh, our example um, um, famous folks earlier, and math. So it's not always the case. Um, that math one we have to take with a little um, caveat and asterisk I'm going to put next to math. And the reason is because we know it's biological, neurobiological in origin, we also know that dyscalculia is neurobiological in origin. And oftentimes we see a high comorbidity between the two of those because of um, neurological um, uh, delays or neurological development issues. So it's not that everybody with dyslexia will have a math strength. So we have to take that with a caveat and just be very careful there. Um, if you see somebody with a math weakness, it does not mean that they don't have dyslexia. It just means that um, you have to look into dyscalculia more, more uh, specifically in that situation. Um, and it's important to really develop those interventions and strategies. Again, this is best practice, but I like to say it over and over again because it's so important. This is really the meat of what we do. And we have to make sure that when we're developing strategies and interventions, we're not just looking at those deficit areas. We're developing them based on cognitive strength. Let me just make a quick stop right here because I am seeing a lot of folks coming through and asking for copies of the slides. Um, I sent them out yesterday. So whoever was um, signed up before yesterday, before, before this morning, um, would have received a copy in an email. It would have been under a heading called Downloadable Files. Um, if you signed up late, 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 late last night into today, you would not have received that email. So please feel free to email um, Sherry, uh, Sherry Locken, who the email should be in the, um, the chat box on the bottom left of the screen. Sorry about that, folks. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew that.